Welcome to the Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church broadcast on the WITRN Network. Come join us as we study the Word of God together. Go get your Bible and let's see what the Holy Spirit is saying to us today. Anybody remember? Friends, fakes, and foes. Oh, thank you. All right, Sister Frida. Friends, fakes, and foes. So we're going to change friends to faithful. So faithful, fakes, and foes. And then we're going to add two more. So we're going to start from the bottom. Foe. And then we're going to add uh, uh, familiar. And then we're going to add fan. And then we're going to add fake. And then we're going to add faithful. Because, okay, at the bottom, it's going to be faux, mm -hmm. then familiar, mm -hmm. then fan, okay. then fake, okay. then faux. So today we're going to talk about all of them as many as we can, but we want to get to understand that each one of us may have been like this in our Christian walk. The enemy become God's friend. The enemy is who God saved. The enemy is who we the foe, who we're encouraged to engage with and even give them a cup of water if needed. Okay? And I was saying to somebody, I asked them which one was the most not familiar, I mean the most dangerous and so which one do y'all think is the most dangerous? Any one of y'all? Anybody? Fake. You think the fake is the most dangerous? Why do you think the fake is the most dangerous? I, I want to know why. I didn't say you was wrong, so don't worry about that. Huh? They're not real. They're not real? What you say? They're pretending. Okay. All right. Good. Good. So the actual person who says they hate Jesus is not the most dangerous person. Because at least you know where they stand. Right. Right. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You think your enemy is the person who says, I hate you. But the enemy that says, I hate you, at least you know where they stand. And they can end up being your friend. Have you ever had a person, when I was in high school, there was a guy named Malachi Bartley. And we were, you know, two bulls in, in, in just trying to do some things. So we got into it, right? And there was going to be incident, I think this is in the 8th or ninth grade, this is going to be an incident whereas, you know, there's going to be a fight at the school between me and him. The two enemies going to fight it out. And and we kind of tussled, but we figured out somewhere in the tussling that they were enjoying us fighting. And guess what? We became good friends after that. So what I learned was the person who you have a problem with is can't end up being your friend if you learn what the real problem is. Right. Yeah. The, the atheists are enemies in one way, but they're the person, the, the right person. It's that one that's in church faking it that is really the enemy. Okay, of Christ. Because they are wolves in sheep's clothing. All right? They are wolves in sheep's clothing. So let's go back. Let's uh, start at 10, Jesus' declaration of what he came to do. Go ahead. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Mm -hmm. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Okay, now we, we remember he said these things because they thought that Okay, this is this is about to go down. Mm -hmm. He in the Jerusalem, he gonna take over, and everything's gonna be right with us. We're gonna be back to Davidic times, and we're gonna be in charge of everything. He's gonna they gonna get he gonna get rid of Rome. So there's gonna be a actual physical uprising of the people that's gonna be strong enough to destroy Rome and put us back in power. So they thought that the kingdom of God, which was promised in the Old Testament, so they're not wrong with thinking that. 
which was promised in the Old Testament, was, was, was going to happen now. Okay? There's nothing worse than having an expectation that's not a plan of God. I'm going to say that again. There's nothing worse than having an expectation that God is not ordained. Okay? Because a lot of times our expectations are off. They're called our desires. The Bible tells us that we pray amiss and we desire amiss because we pray according to what? Our passions. Okay? And they wanted this. The word was there. They're passionate now. So, again, you have to remember, Jesus is on his way to Calvary to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is we know as Passover. He's going to be the Passover lamb once and for all. So, they're thinking this is just a regular Passover, but there was going to be a bit of the kingdom come into existence then. All right. By now, Jesus is a, considered a, a rock star in everybody's eyes. Whether you a foe, whether you the familiar, whether you a fan, whether you a fake, and whether you the faithful, there's a there's pilgrims coming to Jerusalem, coming coming from the coming 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 over from Jericho. And it's, it's thousands of them, okay? And, and, and all of them have heard about Jesus because all of them have heard about Lazarus. Just a while back, he had raised Lazarus from the dead, which is only a few miles from Jericho, Bethany, on the way to Jerusalem. So Lazarus and him had become rock. Lazarus was the evidence. Lazarus was the sign that he was different from everybody else. Now, we know he did a lot of miracles, but that miracle, because Lazarus was well known. You know, that's the difference between him, him raising me from the dead and he's raising a president from the dead. If he raises a president from the dead, everybody knows. He raises me from the dead. Oh, you might know those who are close to me, but a public figure or a person who is important as Lazarus, he raised him from the dead to give them a sign. Now, the sign always points to what? The truth, right? A stop sign tells you to stop. If you don't stop, you violate the sign. A sign always points to something normally uh, more profound than itself. So Jesus doing this sign, it was always for them. Signs and wonders are always for people to believe. But what ends up happening with people who believe in signs and wonders and want that all the time to believe, they tend not to believe the word. Because the word is, has to be studied. The word has to be absorbed. So if I can see a sign and wonder, but the time we live in now, the Bible says that the devil can do false signs and wonders. And a false sign and wonder is a sign that may appeal to your flesh, but its, its origin is to keep you away from God. That's why we don't claim no materialism up in here. God will bless you with different stuff, and that is a blessing. But I will never, ever tell you the, 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 that the only reason you bless is because you got a new car. Or you got a good, or you doing good at your job? That is a blessing. It could be, but if you if you base your relationship on God based upon the material getting of things, you have been tricked. You have been deceived. And nine times out of ten, you've been self deceived. All the devil did was present to you what what he knew is part of mankind: the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's how he gets us all the time. Okay. And, he, and if he appeals to you and you appeal to, and you and that is what you want, he has you because you'll go away from the message of sacrifice. You'll go away from the message of, 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 of condemnation for those who don't believe. You'll go away from the message of even needing the cross because you figured out how to empty out the slot machine of God. And really what you've done is tap into what the devil wants you to do. Distraction. OK, so Jesus now is on his way. And, and you know, and I was thinking, saints. Even though it was a sign for them to see who he was, the sign itself could become a distraction. Because again, they're looking at what he did, and behind what he did, they said he has enough power to destroy our, uh, our oppressor. And I get that. But that's not what he came to do. And he told his disciples, that's not what I came to do. I came to die. And the only way, and, and he came, his name is Jesus, he came to take away the sins of his people. He came to die for the sins, okay? The Garden of Gethsemane moment is that moment of him coming to reality that the time is near and we haven't got to yet. And, and he is going to do this. And in his flesh, 
in his humanity. Yes. Is there any way of the way, Lord, that you can do what needs to be done for the world? No, not thy will, not my will, but thy will be done. All right. So we got the scene. He's on his way. They're following him. Go ahead. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minutes and said to them, Engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. So God in this situation has given that he uses a parable, which I explained the historical part of this parable to be a true story in one. So they're very familiar with the story about the delegation and, 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 the, and the king being appointed over him through Caesar. And it said he received his kingdom. And he gave them something to do. He gave them something to do something with. He gave them a resource. And what he expected was that you would do business, there, the, that you would partake and do business. You would occupy, do business, do as you saw me do, or do as you believe that I would want you to do with what I gave you. All right? In that, we see that God has an expectation. For us, as, as, as children of God, we see that this nobleman went away for a period of time, didn't tell him when he was returned, but when he returned, they had to get an account. And when Jesus returned, we're going to have to give an account. He's going to ask you, what did you do with a bunch of things? But more importantly, he's going to ask you, what did you do with the most important thing I left you was my gospel? What did you do with the thing that could save people's souls? Because that is the goal. That is the goal. The gospel is the gold. Okay. And he's going to ask you, what did you do with it? You had you got saved at 13 and you lived on this earth until you was 80. Did you give anybody the gospel? Or did you fall for the trick of didn't say nothing, but you're going to show it in your behavior? You need to show it in your behavior and you need to be able to say it. And it doesn't take long. You should be able to present the gospel in a few sentences. You know? And when you present it in a few sentences, that spurs them to ask more questions. And now you're going to explain. Don't try to explain it all at once. Let kind of make it short and leave some stuff out on purpose so they can like, well, why do I need a savior? Now, let me explain it to you and why he is my savior. Let me explain that to you. And let me tell you, it's a free gift from God that you don't have to do anything. Then you can go into detail. So he left. The nobleman comes back. He begins to question him and see what they have done with his money. OK, now, remember. In this, in, in this group of followers, in this parable, we're going to see three, but there's actually all five, all the five. There's a familiar there. Because you got to me, he only questioned three of them. We don't know how the other seven responded. But we pray that the other seven took a hint from the one who responded as a foe or as a fake. You may call him a fake. I'm going to leave that up to you guys. What would you call that person? Go ahead. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Stop right there. So we see that they were given money. But because they were faithful, God blessed them with something bigger than money. Because God, they, a nobleman could have gave him what? 10 minutes, 10 more minutes or, yeah. or, or 200 minutes, which we're going to see. But the blessing is because you was faithful with what I gave you to do with whatever it is, you did something with it, whether 10 or 5. And because of that, I'm going to reward you. The faithful will always receive rewards. Always. You can count on that. Because he said, job well done, basically good and faithful servant. And this is what you get for being my servant. In a time where you didn't even know if I was coming back. You didn't know what I was going to do when I came back. 
but you did something with what I gave you until I return. And, and I'm rewarding your faithfulness to me, your faithfulness to the mission, and your faithfulness and good stewardship over what I left you. And what I'm going to give you is probably exceedingly above all you can ask that you can imagine. Because they're servants. They're not thinking they're going to be put in charge of sin. Think about it. They go from being servants to noblemen themselves. That'd be like you go from being who we are now and somebody say, because you've been faithful uh, to God, I'm going to make you mayor of St. Louis. You're like, how did that happen? Well, God can do anything he wants to do. If he wants to put you somewhere because you've been faithful, accept the challenge. He's already equipped you with because you've shown to be faithful. A lot of saints miss out on the fact that they just need to learn how to be faithful. So Carolyn, they just need to learn how to be faithful. You know, we talk about that in different ways, the way that we talked about that. The key is they got to learn how to be faithful. That's true. And the only way they're going to learn how to be faithful, we got to be faithful. And encourage them to be faithful. We can't browbeat them into faithfulness because then they'll resent you. But isn't that a choice so that, that they must make? Of course. You I mean, know. anything is a choice you must make. But it's not for us, the faithful, to jump on them Necessarily when they're not faithful. We'll bring it to their attention. We want to encourage them, see what we can do to help them become faithful. But that is a choice of everybody. You got a choice whether you're going to be faithful or not. But we have to understand the faithfulness following the, the, the in this nobleman, he gave them something they probably least expected. Because he didn't leave saying, if you do this, then I'll do that. He just gave it to him and told him he was leaving. Okay? So there was no quid pro quo. It was, I'm leaving and I'm going to see how faithful you're going to be. God sometimes will deposit stuff with you and not give you any instructions on it. He's just going to see what you're going to do with it. Question. Mm -hmm. When a person keep repeating the same thing over and over again, mm -hmm. you brought it to their attention, mm -hmm. but you're not going to brain I beat them over the head, mm -hmm. but they keep doing the same thing over and over again. How do you deal with that in that particular situation? Give them grace and forgive them and keep moving. Okay. Okay. Don't even let it bother you. Okay. Because at, at some point, you become the problem for your own self. Because you're looking at them so hard, yeah. you can't see yourself. Mm -hmm. You know? That's why we got to be careful. Yeah. The Bible says be careful. Because it could go from I'm telling you that, you remember, because because basically you're asking about the offense part. Well, what does the Bible tell us to do? Forgive them over and over and over and over again. You know, so if they're not faithful in something they're supposed to do with us, for us, to us, then we understand that they just still are immature, maybe. And we are the mature ones, but we don't lord our maturity over them. We need to be more humble. Yeah. See, that's the thing. When somebody does something that, that you don't like, you don't go up, you go down. And that's the hardest thing to do. It's a hard thing to do when you know you've been offended to go even lower than the offense that was, that was put upon you. All right? That is a hard thing to do. And that's a, something that you have to practice. It doesn't happen overnight. It's something that you practice as you live out your life. As situations, CIAs of life come up, you will do that. Okay? So one he gave 10, faithful to the mission. One was better than the other. One was a better salesman or whatever, a business person. He earned 10. The other one earned five. Both of them got rewarded for being faithful to the mission, not how much they achieved. Pay attention to that. Faithful to the mission, not how much they achieved in the mission. Just like when we do walk up prayer. If one come up and get prayer, we've been faithful. Because really, if you think about it, for the four or five of us that's out there, we couldn't handle 50 people walked up wanting prayer. You know what I'm saying? That's just, that's not realistic, you know. But faithful to me is like one person came. The Lord through Purdy gave me this to do with the church. And, and again, it doesn't, everybody doesn't have to do it. But the point is, if nobody going to be there, I'm going to be there. And if one person walk up and receive prayer or Bible study or, or questions and I can answer them, then I've done my job. And I've done my job because I'm a servant. I didn't do it to receive. I did it because God has given me so much. It's a whole way of different dealing with people. And the church needs to get back to dealing with people like God wants us to. 
Okay, we have the answer, but we have to give it from a position of humility, not lording over people. Okay, not presenting ourselves as superior beings because we're fallen creatures too. Okay, only thing we've done is find the answer. But our job is to give other people the answer so we can give people with Frida's age group hope. We can't look at them and be like, oh, they ain't no good. They ain't nothing going good happen to them. And then I have to remind some people in here where Frida and, and some of our 30-somethings are at now, they're, think about it, they come here. I wasn't coming to a place like this when I was 30. I don't know about y'all. I wasn't coming to church when I was 30 and getting good teaching. So, so, so what if sometimes they do what they want to do? They, like I told Frida all the time, to our senior, all of them, they're further along than I was ever to be. So I can't imagine if the Lord blessed me to see them in their forties and fifties. It should they they should be fur they should be way further than all of us in this room, because they're the future walking truth. You know, not put no it ain't no pressure on them, but they if whatever walking truth was going to be in the next twenty years, it's gonna be because of them. But it's going to be because of us and how we demonstrated Christ to them in humility of understanding youth. Sometimes us, as we get older, we forget how we acted when we was young. We act like we always been 50 and smart and older. No, not me. I was, a, I, was, I was crazy compared to what I know about God. I deserved to die, but he saw fit not to. All right, Frida, go ahead. Then another came saying, Lord... Here is your minnow, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. Stop. So so we had a scenario now where this one out of the three makes an excuse. And who does he ultimately blame for his reason not doing what he's supposed to do? The nobleman. The nobleman. He, so if we replace the nobleman with God, who do we blame when we make excuses? Jesus, God, yes. That goes all the way back to the garden. We have a tendency to always look for somebody else's fault or why we don't do what we're supposed to do. Because we don't want to look at our own fault. We don't want to look at our, we don't want, and we want yeah. God to forgive us and bless us. As if we've done something noble. And see, what we do is we present our excuses as being noble. Think about what he said. He said, now look, Lord, you are a Hard man, you reap what you have in sown. You 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 so strict that I was so afraid of you that you know I did this because I because of you, and you I should get something because I gave you power over me. But you remember, he's already their nobleman, and he's saying if you knew all this. And you may have watched the pattern of others. Why did you think that not doing anything with my money was the best? You could have put, like he said, you could have took it to the bank. And at least I could have got the interest off of that. But you didn't do that. You folded it up and put it in your pocket. That lets you know that he didn't even consider the resource itself valuable to him. He figured it was just something he could throw in his pocket, throw in the drawer, and then bring out when it was over with. Can you imagine the months, the days, or the years that went by and this minna is sitting this minna is sitting in his drawer or in his pocket? And he he probably forgot, he probably gave up on God. He probably gave up he was on to return back. So he figured I'll just hold on to it and eventually I'll hold on to it so long that I'll take it and spend it myself. And if he comes back, I'm gonna blame him. So the day came, he comes back and he blames him. So again, don't let your words of excuses end up condemning you. Because now the nobleman switches it around. He said, I'm going to let your own words. If you knew all these things about me, you should have done something. But you didn't do anything. You just kept it to yourself. So that shows you how wretched you are. You, 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 you. Now, what would you, 
how would you describe this person? Is this person an enemy or is this person a faker? Or he's familiar? What what which which category would you put him in? I would say familiar. Why would you say familiar? Because he knew mm -hmm. what he should have done mm -hmm. and he did not do it. Okay. So he he, he already knew what he was and like I say, his words condemned him. Okay. So why would you say you say a fake then? I I'm, and, and again, do, quit trying to worry about right or wrong. Just talk. I say familiar because even though, yeah, he knew him, mm -hmm. you know, he knew that he was hard, but he also thought he knew him enough. Yeah, you hard with everybody else, but you're going to be easy on me because I'm familiar. You know, it's me. You know, familiar, like, not only just the familiar because he in the family, but familiar, like, our relationship, you ain't going to beat me up. Like, you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Like, if I just take care of what you gave me and give it back to you, Sparkly, like how you gave it to me, you ain't gonna, you ain't gonna hurt, you ain't gonna hurt me. I'm, okay. That's why I say the familiar category. So what would the fake look like? Then if that, if he's familiar, what would? Because we might not have the person here, but what would a fake look like? So if you're gonna label him familiar, I'm gonna go with that. So what would a fake look like in this story? It's not in the story, so I'm just telling you what. But but if you label him as familiar, what would the fake look like? Here you go. What's the problem? What's wrong? Why you mad? Well, that's that's the familiar person. You just said that. Fake. What does the fake, fake person look like? Like you said, you tried to do something, but he had an excuse for not doing it. That's right. So, so the fake person is different from me. Is such this? The fake person is the person who overpromises and underperforms. The fake person would say, "Yeah, I'm going to do that," and they don't get it done. Okay. Okay. The familiar doesn't say anything, but expects. You to forgive them when they don't do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we cool. I didn't do anything. Yeah. But the fake person who we say is the most dangerous, the person that says, I will, but don't. Remember, there's a story in the Bible that says, who's the, who's the most honorable son? The son that said, I will and didn't, or the son that said, I won't, and, I, and he did. The one that said, I won't and did. So it's better for you to say no, because no's are in turn, no's. Yeah, no's can be turned into yeses, but yeses are, are heartfelt. When you say yes and turn it into a no, people get get agitated about that. And that's exactly what I was talking about, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Okay. When somebody say yes, and, and they don't follow through on it, yes, it does agitate. Yeah, it, it agitates agitate us. But as Christians, as we know it, it's going to it it naturally agitates us. And when I say it's curling, I say naturally, right? Right. We need to go above that. Yeah. And don't let it bother us because we know how people are. Yeah. See, take her, take control of yourself and go on the power that you got. You walk in the resurrection. You should be able to see it. When somebody act unbecoming, saint or ain't, you already know the issue. The issue is the unsaved person not saved. The issue with the saint is they haven't matured to understand that, that their word should be their bond. So, but ain't no sense you getting all upset because the minute you get upset, now you thrown off. Trust me, being a pastor, I've learned all of that. Sometimes, and Sister Carol has taught me this, and others have taught me this, sometimes you just got to pray for the person to keep your mind together. You know what I'm saying? But I'm glad. The familiar, and I agree with you, that guy's more like the familiar. He's not a fake because he didn't promise anything. Fakes always promise. They want to look good in the beginning of something, and then when the rubber meets the road, they make excuses then on why they didn't do it, but we always end up blaming the person that we have to be accountable to for the reason why we didn't do it. Okay, go ahead, read. And he said to those who stood by, take the minna from him and give it to the one who has the ten minutes. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minutes. I tell you that to everyone who has more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So now, think about this. The one who didn't do anything is going to complain about the person who got 10 cities <laughs> and 10 minutes, that he's going to get one more minute. <laughs> you didn't do nothing. I'll take it from you to give it to somebody else, and you still want to complain. Mm -hmm. Boy, if they ain't like the body of Christ, I don't yes, know what it is. is. Yes, it is. You can't never satisfy nobody. Lord knows and Curly knows we wouldn't be here if I listened to all of y'all. Everybody had an opinion. Remember when we went out? Everybody had an opinion. And too small, too big, not big enough. I just, no, I, no, I don't like this. I don't like that. We still be stuck over there. <laughs> Universal. 
Thank God the boys like, just do it. Mm, praise God. And we was able to get it done. Praise God. And, and that just shows me, again, as people of God, realize you can't you can't please everybody. Okay. And there's always going to be somebody that's going to complain about the good that you do. Yeah. Always. 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 No matter how, how, how much you do for them. No, they they just is it's in them to be contrary. Have you ever met a person who's just, who who's always contrary? Yeah. Never have anything good to say. Never have anything good. You say black, they say white. You say yeah. blue, they say green. Never. Never. You say sweet, they say tart. Yeah. You know, you say tennis shoes, they say dress shoes. They'll never. It's it's built in that bitterness is built in them because there's something lacking in their life, and it's really an understanding of the yeah. salvation that's offered to them. Thank God our Jesus didn't didn't think like that. Because he would have never went to the cross. Well, you, Pastor, isn't a lot of it too, that individual being insecure? Yeah, God said they're insecure. They got issues going on in their life. And, and, and again, instead of trying to resolve it, they try to cover it with their contrariness. Mm -hmm. Okay, being contrary. That's a word. Being contrary. contrary. Yeah, being contrary. Okay, mm -hmm. go ahead, read for you. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Mm. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Okay. So now what he does with the enemies, he recognizes them. And because that reason, the reason why he slaughters them, they didn't want him to rule over them. them. Remember that. He's not slaughtering them because they necessarily done anything, but because they will not accept him. And that's what we talked about Sunday, about the fact that whether you fall in these categories, okay, and what are they? Familiar? Uh, what is it? Foe? What else? What are they? Foe, Okay, I gave you more than that today. What are they? Faithful, friends, We'll say it. Skip friends. Okay, foe, familiar, fan, fake. And faithful. And faithful. Yeah, because a faithful person is a friend. If you want to leave friend there, that's fine. But a faithful person is a friend. Now, now, the, the what 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 I want to point out is is that their only their only issue was they did not want the nobleman who came back as a king to reign over them. So he destroyed them. You're going to have to deal with Jesus no matter one of those categories you're in. You got to deal with you. Him? You got to deal with Jesus. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to answer to him. All of us. All of us going to have to answer. Mm -hmm. The foes are going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the rest and and there's one and 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 the the the, the in the fan. You got a fan. The, the people who are fans. Mm -hmm. Uh we that's going to be next that we're not going to talk about today because none of these people fit in that category. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to add a category because there are people who are are familiar with Christ. Mm -hmm. They're kind of neutral. But neutral is what God says, either you for me or you against me. Mm -hmm. Okay? So he doesn't let you be neutral. Nope. He lets your neutralness condemn you. Some people are familiar. They're just sitting back waiting to see what happens. And once they see what happens that's good in their eyes, then, you know, Johnny come lately. They'll jump on the boat. Mm -hmm. So would that not be familiar not fan too? Yeah. The fan will do that too. The fan will sit in a, and ride, ride, and cheer, cheer, but they'll never get in the game. Okay. Sideline. They'll sit on the sideline. They'll, they'll, and again, they're hard to detect because some of this interwoves with the next one. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you got from from the faithful down, all of that could be in one person. Okay. <laughs> or a progressiveness of a person. Okay. Before they become the faithful, I would think they would have to be a fan. Mm -hmm. And they may go through it through a period of being fake. Okay. They may go through the period of just being familiar. They come, they go. They come, they go. You know, they never commit. They 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 just hanging in there. And, and again, we don't know why they just come and go like that, but they do. And, and again, as a church, as the people of God, since we recognize there are these type of people, we don't put pressure on none of them. We don't put pressure on the enemy. We don't put pressure on the familiar. We don't put pressure on the fake. We don't put pressure on the fan. We just walk and talk before them as we supposed to. All right? Mm -hmm. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Start at verse 9 through 15. Because I want to exhibit how we should do and what we what we what we have been delivered from, and we should understand what 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 people who are not saved do. But understand there's some saved folk that's still struggling with some things. 
You know, just because you've been delivered and you don't do nothing, okay, fine, great, hallelujah. But I know too many people who love God, who's learning about God, is still struggling. First Peter chapter 4. Start uh -huh, verse 9. You said 9 through 15? Yeah, I think 9 through 15. Go ahead, Frida. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now, remember when we read in 19, when he, when, when he went into Zacchaeus' house to show Zacchaeus some hospitality, some love, mm -hmm. what did the church folk do? They grumble. grumble. They, grumble. Uh, they grumble because you're going into a sinner's house. You're going to relate to a sinner. Don't you know that he's a sinner? How many times they said it to Jesus? Don't you know that woman, where that woman came from? She's a prostitute. Mm -hmm. She shouldn't even be touching you. But see, saints touch the untouchable, love the unlovable. Show kindness to those who may need kindness. We don't pick people like ourselves. And that's one of the biggest issues in the church. We become so insulated and isolated that we forget. We can come in here and have a good time in fellowship. But the only point for coming in here is to learn to go to be out there. Mm -hmm. To talk to the lost. Patting each other on the back does me no good. That's why I don't go to a whole bunch of conferences. I don't need I don't I don't need the accolades. I don't go, you know, I I don't speak a lot. I don't need that. I want to equip you to go out there and do the work of the Lord, whatever Lord has called you to do. So be don't grumble. If you're gonna be kind, if I'm gonna do something for Sister Curl or Sister Brown, Sister Lueda, Mother Golson, Joyce, uh 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 Eartha, Frida, if I'm gonna do something from you for you, I better not grumble. Because I didn't need to do it. That's right. Keep you didn't it. Do it from your heart. Yeah, if you don't do it from the heart, don't Keep do it. it. If you don't complain about, if you go, if you gonna come to one of our events as a member and complain the way it's set up and you didn't volunteer to set something up, shut up. That's, That's, right. Right. That's right. Don't let don't let me hear that you complain about something that you ain't did nothing with. Because you your pastor gonna say something to you about it because mm. you didn't say nothing to me about it. And then, but you already know what I was going to say. So do you go sit down somewhere because you didn't help do none of this. But you find people like that all the time. Yeah. They do something and want to get recognized, but then grumble about it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think he should have done that. Oh, I think they should have done this. Mm -hmm. What did you do? Mm -hmm. Just show up to eat. Mm -hmm. We got to stop that, mm -hmm. saints. And again, I'm not talking about walking truth at all in a sense, but if it is, shoot, fist, wear it. But I'm talking about, I've seen this in every church. You always got the grumbling group. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The nitpick on everything. Mm -hmm. Okay? Don't grumble. Go ahead. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. So now we got, the instead of the minas, you receive a gift. The gift comes from God. And he's telling you, the way you want to increase things with me, when I come back, show that you use your gift to serve others. Mm. Don't grumble. Use your gift to serve others. Their instructions are right there. Go ahead. As good stewards of God's very grace. So to be a good steward of God's very grace, effectual love and grace, you need to take the gift and find a way to share it with someone else. Amen. If you ain't sharing your gift with someone else, your gift is going to be taken away from you. He don't owe you a gift. Because the gift is supposed to put you on an assignment to do something. And if you decide of your own free will not to do it, don't think he's going to let you keep that gift. And unless you learn how to build your character and carrying the, the bigger the gift, the bigger the character has to be built, which means the character that is carrying the gift has to suffer. Okay? So some people want all these gifts. Remember, read the Bible. The ones who had the big gifts had to suffer a lot. Oh, yes. Look at what Paul had to go through to carry yes. that gift that God gave him, which was actually a burden, but Paul looked at it as a blessing. Whipped and beaten and shipwrecked and bit by snakes, all for the sake of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And but then God told him, that. He said, "I'm going to show you how much you're going to have to suffer, suffer for my sake." That's right. Okay. So Paul understood because what he wanted, he couldn't get in Judaism. Paul was a religious, righteous, religious man, mm -hmm. but he couldn't achieve what he wanted in the confines of the law. Paul didn't understand until God explained it to him. Mm -hmm. That the law was never meant to make them holy was to show them that they need a savior. Okay? Instead of putting a microscope and a, and a magnifying glass on other people, turn that thing around and make it a mirror and magnify yourself. Okay. Look at yourself. Look at the flaws in you first. And then you're fit to remove the thing from your brother's eye. Right. 
It doesn't say don't. It says these, these are the procedures where you can help your brother and sister. Turn it around on you. And see how you acted when you wanted somebody to believe you, but you knew that you couldn't perform. You were scared. A lot of people, you know, borrow money from you. Everybody in this room had people borrow money from you and say they're going to pay you back. And they never paid you back, right? That's right. Or they promised they was going to pay you back. Yeah. And then when you tried to call them, they act like you, like you did something to them. Mm -hmm. But when, but, but, but when. Get mad. Get mad. Yes. And then yes. when, when you go, but when they were asking for money, they wasn't shy. They, they were, were happy and upbeat because they knew that you would do that because you cared for them. Okay? <laughs> now, as a saint of God, realize people are like that and when they never give out money that you can't walk away from. Nope. Amen. Okay? Never loan money that you can't walk away from. Do that. Because you could be all bent out. They're going about their business. Yep. You never get it. You sitting there talking about it every time you look at them. They, they having a good time with their life. They live their best life now. And you stuck. You see, see, that's the that now the test that was on them that they failed has become your burden, your test, and your anchor that you can't even move forward. See, that's why we got to be careful how we handle things that don't go our way. All right? Go ahead, Frida. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So everything we do, whether we speak, whether we serve, we do all for the glory of God because God has been so good to us. Amen. God has given you 10 minutes, whatever that represents to you. And he wants you to do something and you're going to have to be accountable for it. But remember, the way you give what God's gift is, he gave you the plan on what you need. You give it to somebody else. You graciously, without grumbling, share your gift with somebody else. And it, your gift could be prayer. Your gift could be uh, 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 just being a person who serves. You know, there is a ministry called helps. Yes, yes. And all the ministry, and then even Jesus said, you know, like the little toe, he said it's the little parts that, that uh, the, to him that's more important. The ministry is helps is more important than the ministry of preaching. Mm-hmm. Because how can the preacher preach unless, unless the people put him in a position to, to, to help people put him in position? He I mean, I could do what I do without you guys. In a sense, to the level we do it at, you know? Everything you contribute, your time, your prayers, your money, all that goes into doing what we do now. You know, books and tapes and things you get, all that. Is a is 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 a is a is a blessing of what you do for the ministry, and if more people would take the position of what can I do, mm. just what can I do to help, Amen. Amen. not what I can do to get seen, what can I do to get help? Because he's going to reward those who are faithful, okay. not faithful in what you I do, but faithful in what he's called you to do. And again, I don't know what he's called you to do. I don't spend one day trying to figure out what he's called you to do. What I try to do is you tell me what he's called you to do and the ministry will support you in it until you figure out maybe that's not it. And even if it's not in it, the fact is you did it in what? Faith. Faith. Don't be scared to make mistakes. You didn't, All your life you wasn't scared to make no mistakes when you was a heathen. That's true. That's true. Now you come to God... You've been you hit your the sin debt has been paid for. The power of sin has no more dominion over you, and you scared to make a decision. And the only requirement he has is count up the cost before you do it. Gather all the information you can. Then once you get the information, and you decide to do it, do it to glorify me, and do it in faith. That's it. And I know it's easier said than done because people don't understand. They haven't reached maturity yet, level yet to understand how this simple this is. And it's not that God's going to... And think about this. What God did was reward him in a different way at first. But then also gave him the other 10 minutes. But God rewarded him with, 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 with authority and power because he was a good steward. God can only give you leadership if you're shown to be a good servant. <laughs> You only get leadership if you if you served. Instead of looking for the title, get a towel. 
You, your, your pastor, your leaders, you should be able to look at them and say, I see them serving. I see them serving. They ain't perfect, but I see them serving. Uh, Sunday was a testimony to Sister Carolyn. People see her serving. Mother Golson, we see her serving. A whole walk of truth, we see you serving. That's what makes us different. Not better, just different. Okay. I wish I could import this around the world in a, in a way that I could sit before people instead of looking at me on video because that's the biggest letter, that's the biggest information I get is, can you come to us? And the answer is no. And the reason why is, y'all know I got conditions and stipulations and, you know, some of these churches couldn't, couldn't afford it. And like I said, we're not in the position to do that. But, I, but I'm telling, telling them the simple thing to do, read your Bible, get in a Bible teaching church, learn how to be faithful. You don't have to be fake. You don't have to stay familiar. You don't have to just be a fan. And you don't have to be an enemy. But you're going to answer to Jesus. Every, Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. So you have to understand that. And since we understand the, the picture, we don't get upset when we see people play out their parts. We just let them play. And when we get agitated, and after we said something, you need to address it. After that, pray. So much, so many, God has shown me that prayer does change things, but more important, it changes me. In relationship to the thing I need to change. So when I see the prayers of the righteous avail much, think about it. When Jesus prayed in the Gethsemane, you know, you know the, 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 what the prayer, the prayer didn't change the circumstance, did it? But it, what it did is prepare him to handle it. Because he came to the conclusion, thy will be done. And said, when I come into the conclusion of the glory of God and I can see the glory of God in the challenges of my day-to-day -day life, then God has blessed me with more than the 10 minutes. He's blessed me with an understanding. And what better blessing can you get than you understand the things of God through the word of God, through the spirit of God, and through loving God's word, loving God's people, and the loving assignments that God gives each and every one of us and the gift that will be used for other people other people. So let's pray. Grace Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your people, Lord. Continue to pour into us your knowledge and your wisdom and your love. Let us be willing to give any gift away, Lord, that we may have. And let us be willing to give even the enemy an audience and a cup of water. Lord, teach us how to humble ourselves in every given situation. And Lord, let us walk by faith and not by sight. And continue to let us walk in truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to the Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church broadcast on the WITRN network. Come join us every Sunday at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time for Sunday worship. Bible study is held on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. We are located at 3006 North Lindbergh Boulevard Suite 711, St. Louis, Missouri, 63074. All are welcome and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you for listening to the Walk in Truth Radio Network broadcast. If this message has been a blessing to you consider donating on your favorite platform. You can donate by looking in the description box and picking your favorite platform of choice, Venmo, Cash App or PayPal. Continue listening. And your prayers are needed, welcomed and appreciated.